you have your Bibles there, turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. We continue our study of the characters of the Bible with the idea or the goal to become more understand, to understand better the entire Bible. We don't just want to understand certain stories and know certain names. We want to know how it all works together. We want to know how it all fits together because all together it is the message of hope. It is a message of salvation. Amen? Okay? And so we come on the, the heels of last week's character, Elijah. And I want to remind you a couple of things about Elijah. Elijah was a man's man. Elijah was, in those days, being hairy, uh, was a sign of, it was, it was handsome. I don't know how you feel about, you know, a uh, duck commander with a lot of beard and a lot of hair. But that was Elijah. The man had a lot of hair. He was a hairy man. He was a, he was a handsome man. He was um, a, a man's man. And then comes Elisha, who's bald. And he has very little hair. And the, and the terms, the words that are used seem to indicate that uh, uh, he was pretty um, average looking. Now, those of you that are bald, let me tell you something. Today, bald is beautiful, all right? But I'm talking about then, in those days, they looked at it like, you know, it was a sign of, a, of um, maybe God didn't, have a, didn't, didn't bless you, that God wasn't as, as favorable on you, etc. So you've got Elijah, this man's man, who was uh, not afraid to speak out. He was not afraid to, to stand up. He was brash. He, was, he would speak loudly, and people knew who he was. And when he talked, you know, people, he was charismatic, and he was this kind of guy. And then you had Elisha, on the other hand, who came in behind him, who was very thoughtful, very careful, very um, intentional, and not quite as charismatic. He was more of a, a thinking man's man rather than um, Elijah, who was just simply easy to follow. He was just charismatic. He was just uh, someone who just, people just knew who he was in charge. When you saw him, you knew he was in charge. And then comes Elisha. But let me tell you something about Elisha. He followed the Lord and what the Lord called him to do to a T. Can you say amen to that? He followed God's call for his life. And you're going to see that uh, he was willing to serve in any way and to serve whomever needed it at any time. And the point of that, just kind of getting ready to read these verses, did I ever tell you it was chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2? Okay, verse 1, we're going to start there. The reason I share that with you is that the one thing that both men had was the Lord. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're at, how you're talented, how you're gifted, what God's given you, what kind of person you are, the key is that you have God. And you're going to see that these two guys were two different people, totally different, totally gifted differently, and yet they had one thing in common, and that was God. And that's why both were so successful in leading for the Lord. So would you stand with me? We're going to read verses 1 through 14. This takes up, now we pick up at the end of Elijah's life. You've, hung, you've sung the songs, right? You remember the old days when we had a hymn? Remember the old hymnals? Remember those books? And you'd sing about the old, you know, swing low, sweet chariot. Right? Okay? Well, there's a reason why that came. It probably came, I don't know for sure, but I bet you that came from Elijah and the way Elijah was taken. And so we're going to pick up the story here of where Elijah is taken and Elisha picks up the mantle. I want you to, I want you to catch what happens uh, when that, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, but when we read these verses, I want you to catch that. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel together. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep quiet. 
Everybody knew what was going to happen. This was not a surprise. They knew that the Lord was going to take Elijah. He was going to go. Elijah didn't die. The Lord took him home. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. And that's old news for God. He does that all the time. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. So in other words, you had to stay right there with him, right? And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire, plural, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father. He missed him already. He knew this was his leader. This was his mentor. He was losing the chariots of Israel and its horsemen and he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two pieces. That's what they would do when they were mourning, when they lost someone, right? And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him. Same one that he had used to split the water. Everybody get it? It had fallen off of him. Did it, did it fall right on Elisha or did Elisha have to pick it up? It's not a trick question. Elisha had to pick it up, Yes. We'll get to that. You'll see why I'm asking that question in a minute. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. And then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord... Thank you for great examples of, of men and women in the Bible, people like Elijah and Elisha, people who were different, people who were gifted differently, people who had different talents and abilities, and, and people that you used differently, yet you used both of them. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for using us, because, Lord, many of us are so different. We have so many different things. Lord, it's all come from you. We say thank you, Lord. We say thank you for what you've done for us. We say thank you for your gifts. We say thank you for how you bless us. And I pray, Lord, that you challenge us with this story right now, Lord, of this great man who just quietly watched, listened, learned, and served you. Lord, help us to learn from that in our lives as well. For it's in your very precious name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So the name Elisha means the God is salvation. God is salvation. He was a, we don't know a lot about his life. We know that he was the son of, 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 of Shaphat, not Snapchat. Shaphat. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, but Shaphat. He lived in about the 9th century B.C., somewhere in there. He served the northern kingdom. Now, the kingdoms have split, correct? The kingdoms have split. The northern kingdom, all right, of Israel, which had already split off from Judah down in the south for a long time. Uh, the people there were primarily just worshiping Baal, 
partly because of, I talked about her two weeks ago, Jezebel, probably because of that influence, she had brought in um, idols, and so the people have following their leader. They had a wicked leader, and the people followed. Tell me it's not important who we choose to be our leaders. Amen? Oh boy, it's important. Not just politically, at work, in your families, etc. When you choose someone to be a leader at church or wherever you are at, when you choose to be a leader, when you choose someone to be your leader, pray about it. Consider what God's ideas are because, boy, you can see the influence for generations after Jezebel left. But anyways, Elisha was called to the ministry by Elijah when he was a farmer. So all we know about Elisha's past is that he was a farmer. He was just quietly farming at his home. He was doing the work that he had to do. He worked hard. Apparently he worked hard. He was a, I guess we'd call him a blue collar kind of guy. He was a hard worker. He uh, didn't mind getting his hands dirty, but we don't know a lot about him. But as soon as Elijah called him, he left everything and completely followed the teacher, Elijah. Much like, you know, when, when Jesus called him and said to be fishers of men. Remember? You know, they left everything. They left the nets right there and they left. When Elisha was called, he picked up and he left and he followed Elijah. Now, he was trained by Elijah for a long time. We continue to hear stories and stories and stories of what Elijah was doing. We don't hear Elisha's name mentioned that often. But we know that he was following Elijah. He know, we know that he'd already been called by Elijah to follow him. God had already told Elijah that that was going to be the prophet someday. So he knew what his calling was. But apparently, he don't, you don't hear a lot about him. Apparently, he's just following and learning and watching, spending time with Elijah, spending time learning, getting that training. And of course, then we get to the story that we read this morning when Elijah is taken up to heaven in the whirlwind, the chariots of fire. And because of his faithfulness, because he was there, because he stuck by him, because he didn't give up, Elijah, Elijah kept saying, it's okay, just, just, just go. You, don't, you can wait for me. I've got stuff to do. I'm not leaving you. No, it's okay. I'm going to go out to the next town. Don't worry. You've done enough. I'm not leaving you. I'm, I'm sticking this out. I'm sticking with you. That was Elisha. Through the good times, through the bad times, through the challenging times. He missed him. You heard he, was, he tore his clothes when he left. It was like his father figure. He had lost his father figure when the Lord took him home. He missed him, but he stuck it out. He stuck with him that whole time. And when he asked him, okay, what can I do for you before I leave? He said, I want a double portion of your, your spirit. Basically what that's saying, he's not saying, I want to be double, I want to be twice as powerful as you, Elijah. No, that's not what that meant. It meant he wanted to be treated like the firstborn. The double portion went to the firstborn, right? So when someone had a son, firstborn son got the double portion compared to everyone else. He wanted to be treated like his spiritual son, like he was the first. He wanted to be treated, and he was, and he was treated that way. He got the mantle. We'll talk about that in a second. He was treated as though he was the, the firstborn of Elijah's ministry, like his, his spiritual son, so to speak. And when he is taken up, when Elijah is taken up, his mantle falls, and the and scripture says, and we'll talk about why that's important in a minute, that he reached down, Elisha reached down, and he picked up that mantle, and he took on the responsibility. You say, what is a mantle? It was just like a, a, a cloak. It was like a, I don't know, you want to call it a shawl or something they would wear around them. That, and it was, when people saw that, they said, okay, that's the prophet of God. That's, the, that's what they wear. That shows people who he is, right? It would be like you wearing a, a badge and said, I work here, or whatever, you know. You wear that around, and it said, oh, that's the prophet. So when he picked that up, it's like saying, okay, now I'm taking on the responsibilities of being the prophet. And, and, and let me make sure you understand this clearly. He knew full well what it meant to pick that thing up. It meant that he was going to be the prophet of God. It meant that he was going to have the responsibilities of being the prophet of God. It meant that he was going to be attacked by others because he's the prophet of God. He picked up that responsibility and he put on that mantle and with that mantle came all the responsibilities with it. And he took it on and he took it willingly. He put that on. 
And so the Bible says that Elisha's ministry was anointed by the power of God. God empowered him. In fact, immediately it says he empowered him because he went back over the Jordan. They had crossed over the Jordan. Elijah had done that. Elisha had seen Elijah do many miracles. And so immediately, what does he do? He picks it up and he goes over and he strikes the water and he goes back over. And it's the first of many, many, many miracles that Elisha does. In fact, I think Elijah is more well known, don't you think? I think Elijah's more well known, at least growing up in Sunday school, we sang songs about Elijah. I don't remember singing songs about Elisha, okay? So I remember Elijah more. I can remember singing songs when I grew up, you know, just songs about, you know, just Christian songs about Elijah and, and the, you know, chariots, etc. But if you research it more, uh, Elisha performed more miracles than any other person in the Bible except for Jesus himself. More miracles are recorded, at least, let's put it that way, in the Bible than any other character in the Bible except for Jesus himself. In fact, during this study this week, um, I've kind of found this, I've got a study in the future that I'm planning. I've got a 14-part se uh, series that I want to do on 14 of his main miracles that he did. So I, I want to do that in the future sometime next year or something. It's something God's kind of working on, I'm trying to um, organize, but I think I'm excited about it because there's so much you can learn from each one of these miracles. Every one of these miracles that he performed has some fantastic lessons that we can learn about life. And we'll get there, but until that time, you've got the Bible, you can read it. Amen? Okay? I'm going to preach about them next year, but you can read it, you can know them better than I do uh, right now. So, Elisha, very important ministry. Lasts from about 850 to 800, somewhere in there, B.C. He had, in fact, he is so important that he advised four different kings came to him in his time that he was serving. Four different kings came to him for advice. Now, kings in that time, remember, uh, some of these kings were good, some were bad. Many were bad on one side. In fact, one side, all of them were bad. On the other side, they had good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. And these kings were very prideful. Rarely would they go to someone else and get advice. They were kings. They would say, no, people need to come to me. But in Elisha's case, four different kings went to him for advice. I mean, is God using him or what? I mean, God's using him in a mighty, mighty way. So each of these miracles had important lessons. Each of these stories had important lessons. We don't have time for all these miracles. I'd love to get into two of them or some, two of my favorite stories in all the Bible. We just don't have time for But some of the things that we can learn from and just knowing Elisha, because that's all we're trying to do in this study of the characters of God, is just kind of get to know them generally so when you read your reading, you have an idea basically who he was and what he was about, right? So number one is this, I was teasing with you, but it's true, Elisha was bald. It plays, you might say, like, why is that such a big deal? It plays a major part in one of the miracles and one of the things that happened in his life. One of the events happens, like uh, uh, these boys come up and start teasing him, etc. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that some other time. But basically, uh, they were killed for what they did. Okay? Um, all I can tell you is don't mess with bears. Okay? I'll let you read the story yourself. But he was bald, and unlike Elijah, who was very hairy and very uh, handsome and People who know the scriptures better than I suggest that it was not just the hair that they were um, in those times. That was a sign of being handsome. That was a sign of being um, accepted in society. Apparently, Elisha was not, uh, let's say, on the cover of the Jerusalem GQ magazine. You hear what I'm saying, people? Do they have GQ anymore? Do they not have that anymore? Am I dating myself? I don't know what magazines are out there. Do they even make magazines anymore? I don't know. Okay. Uh, he was not the best looking dude. Apparently, Elijah was the kind of guy that would strike you. You'd say, whoa, that's a good looking guy. And Elisha would come in, you'd say, oh, yeah, that's, that's Elijah. Yeah. Some of us have been there. Some of us understand. Some of us understand that sometimes people have different gifts and different talents, etc. But let me tell you something. It's reasonable to assume that while he was not handsome, let me tell you something. He was still a very, very special man. I, I, I think it's fair to say these, this day and age, too much emphasis is made on the outside appearance. I mean, should we take care of ourselves? Sure. Right? 
But I think you know as well as I do that uh, beauty is on the inside. Now, Elijah was a beautiful man on the inside too. Don't misunderstand me when I tell you that he was good looking on the outside apparently. He was a beautiful man on the inside. But Elisha was, don't, don't miss what God has done through people that maybe don't look the same as you or look differently or from a different place. Because God blesses, blesses us through people like that so much. Well, Elisha was unlike Elijah. Elijah talks about, in the stories of Elijah, he was a, kind of a loner. He'd be kind of go out on his own a lot. He'd be on by himself. In fact, he even asked a few times for Elisha to kind of like, let, let him go. Let him go do his thing alone. He kind of wanted to do this on, even all the way up to the end of his life, right? And Elisha kept saying, I'm not leaving you. I'm not going. You can keep saying it all you want. I'm not leaving. Got to love that loyalty, huh? He kept saying that over and over. Elisha wasn't like that, though. He wasn't a loner. In fact, uh, the, the scriptures say that he had a home in Samaria. 2 Kings chapter 6 talks about how he had a home in Samaria. And he was able to, according to some of these stories and some of the miracles that we'll study later, hopefully you'll read, he was able to effect change with some of these kings even while they were not necessarily God-fearing men, they would still come and follow Elisha. They would still come and ask Elisha for, for advice. Even these men that were not God-fearing, they understood that this guy, maybe they didn't agree with his religious views or his faith, as we would say. They definitely could see that this man was, was trustworthy, that he was dependable, that he was wise, that he was discerning. Isn't that beautiful? That's like saying that even non-Christians would say, look, I don't believe the same way you do, but because of your behavior, because of the way you act, because you're sensible and you're kind and you've shown yourself to be trustworthy, I'm going to go to you for advice, even though I don't necessarily agree with your faith. I can go to you for advice. Elijah, Elijah's not that kind of guy. Elijah would have said, you know, uh, you're ungodly, and he would have stood up. It would have been a different... He, he struck people. Well, he was very divisive. But Elisha found a way to kind of work his way into some of those areas where people were not believers necessarily. Some of you are very good at that. Some of you are very good at being able to, to have an effect or, a change, or an impact on people's lives, even though they're not necessarily believers. We need to be a light in our dark world. That was what Elisha was able to do. Elisha was able to affect a positive change without compromising his beliefs but still, he was able, I guess the best way to say it is, he could be in it, but not of it. Does that make sense? Today, as Christians, a lot of places you're going to go, boy, Southern California. Let's just say Southern California only. There's a lot of places we can go that are not Christian. Amen? They're not godly. But we're supposed to be godly in those places. And it's not okay and I get it, when we're trying to be holy, you're trying to be separate, you're trying to be different, right? But that doesn't do any good if you move off in the top of a mountain and stay away from everybody and try to be holy all by yourself. And these, I'm just going to call it like I see it, these cults that decide that they want to leave and separate themselves, that's not what God said. That's not what he called us to do. He called us to get in the middle of it, get your hands dirty in the middle of all the sinners, of which we are sinners too, and get in the middle and act like a Christian in the middle of an unchristian world. You get what I'm saying? This is what Elisha could do. He was an advisor of, of kings and, 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 and leaders and people would come to him even though they didn't believe in God. That's just, uh, anyways. Now, he got people that get angry at him. He got a lot of people that would get angry at him. But still, they would come and seek out his counsel. 2 Kings chapter 3, 2 Kings chapter 8. Uh, even, even Joash was very sorry to see him die at the end of his life. 2 Kings chapter 13. Even Joash was very sad to see him die. Joash wasn't always the godliest man. Okay? And so, here, Elisha served all these people well. You know, even if people don't agree with our faith, we should still be somebody who makes a positive impact on those people's lives. Many of you don't work like where I do at a Christian place all day long. Now, even at a Christian place, you're working with people that are not Christian necessarily, but many of you work in the secular realm, okay? And you, you understand what I'm saying. 
you, God's called you to that place. That's your calling. When, you, when he picked up that mantle when Elijah died and he took on those responsibilities, you do the same when you accepted that job. God gave you that job. And he put you in that place. My, my sister Kulan is at a public school. God gave her that responsibility. He put that responsibility on her shoulders. And he said, I want you to be a light in the darkness. I want you to be a representation of Christ in a place where they don't necessarily claim Christ. That's what he's called all of us to do. Well, anyways, Elisha also was very good at serving the poor. Elisha had a heart. Now, that's not to say that Elijah didn't, but Elisha, Elijah was, he was the kind that was always up there making the speeches, is always out in the front. He was the one always out in the forefront. People would always see and hear. But then behind the scenes, there's Elisha in the back trying to look for the poor people, trying to help them behind the scenes. We need both, don't we? We need both. We need people who are not afraid to be stand up and, and to talk and to speak. And we need people who are not afraid to stand behind the scenes and serve those that are maybe getting forgotten or not seen. And that was Elisha. He was not afraid to serve those poor people. He helped the helpless. He helped those that couldn't pay him back. Look at, I want you to look at James chapter 1. Look at James. Turn over to the New Testament. You remember who James was? James was the half-brother of Jesus. You think it's hard being related to your brother or sister. James was the half-brother of Jesus, meaning same mom, different dad, amen? Same mom, half-brother of Jesus. And James was not a believer until he saw his brother um, all of a sudden die on a cross, get buried in a tomb, and then three days later he's walking around talking. I, I think that would make um, all of us believers, amen? Then all of a sudden James said, um, you know what, there must be something to this whole thing. He got smart. Pretty soon he became the leader of one of the biggest churches in, the, in, that, in that time. But James said this about what does it mean. He got real practical. James is a great book. If you're like me and you like to take things down to the bottom line, like let's just get, let's get down to business. Let's, just, let's get down where the rubber hits the road. Let's get practical here. Okay? Then James is your man. Look at James chapter 1, verse 27. I don't like the word religion. It's not necessarily the best word we would use today. So it'd be like your faith. He's using this word religion. But your faith, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. This is what it looks like. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Do what God's asked you to do. In other words, don't sin. And what else? Help those that can't help themselves. Did you catch that? Widows, orphans, in those days especially, still today is this way, but in those days especially, widows and orphans had almost no means of taking care of themselves. So I want you to kind of compare that to whatever part of society would be like today. Those that cannot help themselves. Those that have uh, mental issues. Those that have physical issues, those that have, you know, financial issues, those that can't, don't have a home, those that don't have whatever, you, you can define that any way you want, but those that cannot help themselves, God's calling us to help them. Stand up for those that can't speak for themselves. Let's see. Uh, how about the unborn? Amen? Speak for those that can't speak for themselves. How about the elderly? How about, the, you know, those that the society looks at as not being worth anything? No, they have value because Jesus died on the cross for them. So therefore, they have value. And that's what one of the things, one of the things that Elisha did so well. And again, it's like every one of these characters, I keep telling you this every week, there's no way to talk about everything about Elisha in one Sunday. But here's this behind-the-scenes guy who is super powerful, just like Elijah was in front of the scenes. Here's this guy, and, and he, he loved serving those people that couldn't help themselves. His ministry reached all classes of people. In the different um, uh, miracles that, that are recorded in Scripture, only the, at least the ones that are recorded, there are other ones, I'm sure, that happened that were not recorded. But in those miracles, the poor, the rich, noble, peasants, Jews, foreigners, all of them are served or helped in some way. He served and helped whoever needed help. 
He didn't care what class they were. He didn't care what color skin they were. He didn't care what gender they were. He didn't care where they were from, from the wrong side of the tracks or whatever. He helped those that needed help. He didn't care if you voted differently than me. I mean, can we get over that, please? Everybody hear what I'm saying? It's coming up. It got real quiet. It's coming up in November. Hey, Jesus died. I hate to tell you this. I want to see a t-shirt. You see a lot of ugly t-shirts during uh, when it's time to vote. Election season, don't you? I want to see one that says, Jesus died for Democrats and Republicans. There's going to be some of both in heaven. And I would tell you to get over it because you're going to be in heaven with them whether you like it or not. But your body's going to change and so it won't matter to you when you get there. So God's going to take care of you getting over it. But get over it. I mean, anyone that needs our help, that's who God's called us to help. And that was Elisha. He helped whomever needed it. He also had a lot of courage. This guy, even though he was behind the scenes guy, you might think, well, Elijah was the guy that had all the courage and Elisha didn't. No, Elijah had a lot of courage too. In fact, one of the stories um, shows you that he was not afraid of any people, even an entire army of Aram who surrounded a city trying to capture him. He just walked right out. He wasn't afraid of them at all. And why? Because he was arrogant or prideful? No, because he knew he served the one and true God. And so he walked out, and I'll let you read about how he took care of that situation. It's one of the ones that I want to, it's one of my favorite stories that I want to share sometime in a study of these, these miracles. But the source of that courage, he knew it was God who controlled and protected him in his life. That's where his courage came from. Even all the way up to the day he died on his deathbed. Even all the way on his deathbed. You would think at some point when you're on your deathbed, you could be a little selfish, right? You're like, um, you know, I'm about to die, so how about I just focus on me for a second? No. Not Elisha. No. Even all the way up to the very last breath, he was giving a visiting king a message that God had given him to give to that king. The king came to come see him, and, and Elisha told him what God had told him to... Uh, Elisha told the king what God had told Elisha to tell the king. Right before he took his last breaths. I mean, he's serving God to the very last breath. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care if you're 8, if you're 98, God has a purpose for you. He has somewhere for you to serve. He has somewhere... We're, we're reading about the... Um, the fruits, I mean, pardon me, the, the talents, the gifts that we have, spiritual gifts that we have in our Bible study on Sunday mornings. I can't wait till next week we're going to start really getting into them, unpacking them. Um, every one of us has spiritual gifts. Every one of us is important. Every one of us has something that we need to be doing for God because he gifted us. And, and the, the study that we're doing talks about that, you know, the church is a puzzle and that every piece is important. You ever tried to do a puzzle and get to the very end and realize you lost a piece? I bet you anything, you didn't frame that puzzle and put it on the wall with the little sticky glue with a piece missing. If you did, you, well, you, you got issues. That's all I got to say. Let, nobody puts that up there with a piece missing. Do you understand? When you're not here, a piece of our puzzle is missing. Does that make sense? And, and you could do like what I did when I was a kid and try to take the square box and put it in the round hole and force it in, but it ain't going to work. Okay? And you say, well, it's not that important I'm there. No, it is very important you're there because there's only one of you and you're the one piece that'll fit that puzzle. God created the puzzle. You're the one piece. That's how important you are. You say, well, I don't even think people know my name. Let me tell you something. We need you. You're important. Every puzzle has every piece. Every piece is important. Every piece. So anyways, he's helping people all the way up to the end of his life. Boy, you talk about a finisher. Boy, that's something we need more of. People who will serve God and finish whatever God's called them to do. If he's called you to, work, uh, to serve in the back, you do it every day until the day you die. If God's called you to stand up here and preach, do it till every day until the day you die. If he's called you to come and decorate the church, you come and do it till the day you die. If he's called you to come and paint the church, <laughs> a little 
That's a little jab there we need to paint. Um, you know, if he's called you to paint, if he's called you to do whatever, hey, you do it to the day you die. Serve him as much as you can until the day he takes you home. Serve, serve, serve. He was a finisher. He finished what God called him to do, even on his deathbed. Now, uh, in fact, even after he died, in, in another one of my favorite stories, 2 Kings chapter 13, they buried Elisha's bones. Okay? They buried his body. His body had decayed, and the bones were all that was exposed. So it's been a while, yes? Some guys come. I'm shortening the story for the point of this you know, morning. But they throw a dead body on that hole. That body hits those bones, and guess what the body happen, happens to the body? Boom! Bops back up. He's alive again. What? Why don't they make movies of this stuff? Is that not amazing? I don't understand how you can't get excited about this. This is amazing stuff. They were a dead guy's bones. And a dead body falls on top. And it brings that dead body back to life. Why? Because God is still working through him. Tell me your, what you do and your reputation and, and who you are doesn't live on after you've gone to heaven. What you do matters. What you do matters. Because people are going to know. And your name, even when you've gone to heaven, your name should still, your reputation, what people remember about you, should still drive people closer to God. Huh? You listening to what I'm saying? Yeah. Your reputation, the kind of person you are. It's not just so you can get a plaque of yourself on a building somewhere. It's so that people will see you and you're still an example. You're still a witness. Your life, even though you've gone to heaven, can still be a witness for those that are still here. And they can say, oh man, I remember so-and-so. Let me tell you about so-and-so. And just telling stories about you should bring people, should convict their hearts and bring them closer to the Lord. Are you with me? Okay, so this is an amazing man. Well, anyway, some lessons we can learn about his life. I could talk about Elisha for a long time. I used to think I liked Elijah more, but I like Elisha more. I just do, because I just, I, just, I just identify with him more. I just think he's just, you know, someone that didn't, wasn't necessarily obviously talented on the outside, but he served God with every bit of who he was, every ounce of what he had. He gave to God. Well, anyways, let's talk about some lessons we can learn here at our church from the life of Elisha. And it starts, number one, your outline there, from the way that he trained under Elijah. Elijah took the time. Here's a guy who is, I mean, he's got a full-time job being a prophet of God in, those, in that day and age where people were, um, let's just say, very ungodly. It's like being an evangelist uh, in L.A. You got a full-time job, baby. There's a lot of evangelism needing to, needing to happen there. And, and this guy is a full-time, Elijah, the prophet, is a full-time prophet. But he takes time to train up his successor. I'm going to ask a tough question. Every one of these, I'm going to give you five. I'm going to give you five lessons we can learn from his life, and then I'm going to ask you a tough question along with the lesson. So you ready? Here's the first question on number one. Um, <laughs> is some of the reason why? I'm just throwing an idea out there. Is some of the reason why we have empty seats here every Sunday? Because we have not taken seriously the responsibility to train up others behind us to fill those seats. I, I got news for you. We're not going to be here forever. Huh? We're not going to be here forever. We're not going to be here forever. So what are we doing to train up the future leaders of our church today? What are we doing? What are you doing to encourage the future leaders of our church? You say, what are you talking about? Like a future pastor? No, no, no. More than just a pastor. The future workers, the future members, the future, the people that keep this machine going, this machine that's supposed to be, you know, following the Lord and, and, and leading people to Christ. What are we doing to make sure it's going to be open in another 50 years? What are you doing right now? To make sure that you're helping encourage those 
who come behind us to come in and continue to serve, to continue to be here, that are needed. Make sure they know that they're needed. What, who, what are you doing and who are you investing in in our church? See, if your full-time job is investing in your spiritual walk, you're missing the boat. Serving others is what it's all about. And in so doing, serving others, the Lord teaches you. Okay? I, I deal with kids every day. And I can tell you a lot of funny stories about kids every day. They teach me something every single day. I learn something from those little knuckleheads every single day. Man, oh man. Who are you? Not, not what, who. And when I say who, you should have a name at least, if not more than one name. And this could be a child. It could be a young adult. It could be an adult, full-on adult. It could be whomever. Who are you investing your life in? Jesus poured himself out for us. Who are you pouring yourself into? You hear my question? Who are you taking your time, your resources, your energy, your efforts to pour into for the future of our church? Think about that. Who are you investing in? Who are you investing your time in? It's just like, just like money you invest in, right? You put money into an account because you hope that it's going to like increase, right? That's what you hope. You put money in there hoping that it's going to increase, it's going to multiply. If you pour into somebody, if you pray and the Lord puts a, a person on your heart and you pour into their life, you spend time with them, you pray with them, you check on them, you call them, you, you, you reach out to them, you let them know you're praying, you, you spend time, have lunch, do whatever. You, you invest, however God calls you to do. You invest in them. It's not like financial stuff where it may go up, it may go down. That will pay dividends every single time. If I could guarantee you that you were going to make money on your investment, wouldn't you, uh, guaranteed, 100% guaranteed you will not lose money. Wouldn't that be something you'd want to invest your money in? Okay, I can guarantee you that if you invest in someone else's life, it will pay dividends every time. Who are you investing in like Elijah did for Elisha? Think about this. How many people did Elisha lead to the Lord? Well, would that have happened had it not been for Elijah spending his time investing in Elisha? Would that not have happened if the person before Elijah had trained him, if they had, the person before him hadn't trained him, etc.? You've got to pour into that next person so that they can lead others to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That, that's got to be more important to us. And I'm going to ask you that tough question again. Could it be that these empty chairs around here are because we have not taken that seriously and not, not, not taken it personally and said, I must train up others. I must let them know that they are important. I wonder why young kids don't come back. I wonder why young kids don't come back and continue to serve, continue to worship here. Is it because they don't feel important? Is it because they don't feel needed? Is it because they don't feel like anyone cares if they are here? Number two. Elisha was not afraid to pick up that mantle of Elijah, despite knowing how much work it would be. Had Elisha watched Elijah serve? It's an easy question. Had, had Elisha watched Elijah serve God? Yes, apparently for a long time. Years, apparently. He trained under him. So he knew the responsibilities. He knew the job was dangerous when he took it. Some of you know what cartoon I'm talking about. He knew the job was dangerous. He knew what he was picking up. That mantle fell on the ground. Elijah got taken up to heaven. I can't wait for that day when he takes us up. Amen? And that mantle fell. And Elijah had to make the decision. Am I going to take that responsibility on? Am I going to take on that responsibility? Well, others will attack. Others will look down on me. I, I'm, I'm taking on a life of service rather than serving myself. I'm serving others. I'm taking on a life where I'm going to put others ahead of myself, others' needs in front of my rights, others' rights in front of my needs. I'm going to put others ahead of me. And he reached down and he picked that mantle 
up. God didn't just drop, God, listen, God had just taken him up to heaven without dying. Do you think it would have been a big deal for God to just make the mantle fall on Elisha's shoulders? I think God could handle that, don't you think? I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm being facetious here, people, wake up. Of course God could handle it. God, I mean, God could do anything. He could have made the, the, the mantle just, you know, slowly, you know, fall down. Ooh. But there was a reason, because God doesn't make mistakes. He had that thing fall on the ground, and he said, okay, now, Elisha, your decision. Pick it up. Are you going to pick it up? Are you going to do what I've called you to do? Yeah, he had to pick it up. He had to make the conscious decision to take the responsibility of God's will for his life. Some of you know doggone well what God's will is for your life. And you're not doing it because it's not easy, because it's not what you want, because it's not as, uh, doesn't pay as well, or because of whatever other reason. I don't know why. But whatever reason, you're avoiding the will of God because it's not what you want, it's not comfortable, or whatever. I got news for you. You will never make a better decision than to pick up the will of God and take it on 100%. The best thing you can do is to do God's will. Now, I'm going to warn you. The world looks at that and says, don't pick that up. Are you crazy? You're going to lose all your vacation days. Don't pick that up. You're taking a pay cut. Don't pick that up. People are going to, you're going to lose friends. You're going to lose influence. People aren't going to like you. People are going to stop hanging out with you. You're going to lose, you're not going to be able to do this. You're going to lose that. You're going to lose this. You're not going to be as cool. Whatever. The world thinks you're nuts. Do you realize people think you are absolutely nuts being here today? Yeah. They're like, look, I've seen your pastor. He's nuts. You're nuts for going there and listening to him. You're nuts for going to church. They think you're crazy. Because you believe in some God out there. So you're taking on a responsibility of representing God in their lives. That's a big responsibility. Yes or no? That's a huge responsibility. Do you realize, I know it's a cliche old statement, but it, I really like the old statement. Still, it still rings true to me. Some of the workers you work with will never crack a Bible open. You are the only Bible they will ever read. I mean, it's the truth. They will never be, they wouldn't know a Bible from Huckleberry Finn. I bet you they didn't read either. You understand? You are the Bible. That is a responsibility that you took on. You picked that up. When you asked Jesus to come into your heart, you took that responsibility on. Don't think that now I can just sit back and let God serve me. No, no. Now it's time for you to serve others. And that's what Elisha did. What, question on this one now, what mantles are lying on the ground waiting for you to pick them up? Just think about that for a second. What things is God calling you to do it's your responsibility to do. Listen, you can, you can, I'm not going to talk specific names, but I'm going to leave it in generalities. Maybe you'll get my point. You can talk about what other people are doing. You can down talk other people stepping up. You can say, you know, I'll use me for example. You can go home and say, Lincoln never makes any sense. I think he only owns black shirts. I don't think I've ever seen him wear anything other than a black shirt. The guy doesn't make any sense. All he does is yell and dance around and, and, and acts like a fool the whole time. You can down talk me all you want, but I got a question for you. When are you going to step up and do what God called you to do? Now, I don't think that's happening with me. I'm just using me as an example. But I do think it happens with other people who come up and serve here. And I hate to be ugly and confrontational. I don't mean to be like that, but I want you to think about this. Hey, uh, when are you going to stop complaining about them and start doing what you did? You can complain about someone else picking up their mantle all you want, but until you pick up your mantle, how about you just shut your trap? How about that? You hear what I'm saying? You can say what you want about Elisha. He picked up his mantle. What mantle lies at your feet that you're not picking up? 
What ways should you be serving? Some of you know doggone well what I'm talking about. God has called you to do something, a Bible study, uh, a, a group, uh, what, I don't know, whatever it is he's called you to do. He's calling you to do something. Ladies and gentlemen, pick it up. Do it. Number three. <clears throat> Elisha followed God without ever looking back. He's out there farming. Now, uh, I've never farmed, so forgive my demonstration of farming, okay? Kind of looks like I'm dancing. I'm supposed to be farming, okay? So I'm farming. This is me farming, okay? I've raked leaves. I can do that. And I've raked leaves. I know how to do that. Uh, here I am. I'm farming. And Elijah, I guess I'm farming with some music on, right, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> I'm farming. And, uh, and here comes Elijah, and he says, follow me, God's called me, you're the prophet. And here's what he does. Drops the rake and follows. That takes some guts. That takes some guts. It takes some guts to make big changes in your life because you think God's calling you to do it. It takes big guts to change your job. It takes big guts to change your decision on what you believe. It takes big guts to leave people behind who are not good for you. It takes some big guts to say, you know what? I don't think that person is good for me anymore. He doesn't bring me closer to God. I only want people in my life that bring me closer to God. So I'm going I'm to leave them out. I hate to tell you, sometimes those people have the uh, same uh, blood as you do. Sometimes those people have the same last name as you do. Sometimes those people are related to you. Sometimes they're your best friends for life. Sometimes they're, you know, people that you loved and depended on a whole lot. But uh, you know what? Is God important or not? Drop it. He sacrificed everything. He gave up everything. He walked away. The Bible never once ever, <clears throat> First Kings, Second Kings, anywhere in there, never once says, all he asked, it never says he went back and never went back to his way of life. All it says is that he asked, before I leave, let me say goodbye to my parents. That's all he did. That's all the Bible says he did. After that, he left. He went, said goodbye to his parents, and he left. I love it. He was not afraid. What about us? He gave everything to God. Are you willing to give everything to God? Here's what happens. We're willing to give parts of our lives to God but, I mean, come on, let's, let's be reasonable here, Pastor. I mean, come on now, don't, don't be asking me to give everything. I mean, come on now. This is some me time. I got news for you. There ain't no more me time. It's all God time. I love when people say that. Oh, I had to take some me time. I'm glad Jesus didn't do that that one day when he was going on the cross. Hey, guys, you know what? That, that's Jesus throwing down the cross uh, you know what, I, I, got, I need some me time. I don't have time for this right now. The guy goes up with a you know, whip, he grabs the whip. I don't got time for this no more. Seen too many movies, huh? I'm glad Jesus didn't decide he had needed me time. It was all about us. 100%, he gave his life. So if Jesus died on the cross for you, and I bet every one of us can say, amen, Jesus died on the cross for me, Amen. If he could give his life for you, I think you could give up some extra time or pick up a mantle or two and do what God's called you to do. What do you think? Amen. Amen. It's about time we did. It's about time we did. Let me, let me ask you. I'm going to get even harder. Do we try to hang on to the past? Do we try to follow God, but we try to keep part of our past? Do we try to say, okay, God, I'm going to give you this part of my life, but this part, no, this is mine. I'm going to give you this part, but you know, this, no. Um, you know, my, my personal time, my Saturdays, I can do whatever I want. Uh, no, there's nothing in the Bible that says, you know, um, you go to the Lord on Sunday, but you live like the devil on Saturday. You live like God every day of the week. This just happens to be the day we come together and worship together, and I thank God for it. I need to see you guys every week. I need that. You do too. But we can't be holding back any part of our lives or any part of our previous lives. Some of those old habits, when you come to the Lord, those habits must change. And I didn't say some, I mean every single one. You don't talk the same as you did before you were saved. You don't go to the same places that you went to as when you, before you were saved. 
You don't wear the same clothes as you did when you were saved, before you were saved. You don't hang out with the same people. Now, is some of them the same? Yes, some are going to be the same, but not the exact same because every part of your life should change. Every part. You don't hold back. Questions I want to ask you. Do you uh, maybe need to let go of some of your former friends or some of your former practices or maybe even your job to give yourself completely 100% to God? I'm going to ask you again. Do you have a friend in your life that you need to cut ties with because that friend pulls you away from God? You're not loving them unless you're bringing them closer to the Lord. And maybe the only way to bring them closer to the Lord is to say, look, until you change what you're doing, I can't be with you anymore because God is first. And as much as I love you, brother, I can't be with you because you're pulling me away from God. Maybe it's a job that does that. Maybe in changing your job, you're going to make less money. Oh, oh. Why is it that we feel like when, when we're offered a new job that has, pays us more money, we see that as a blessing from God? But when we find a new job that pays us less, we see it as, well, you know, uh, I can't complain. Um, you know, I've got a lot of good things, too. It's a blessing from God either way. Hmm. Let's not look back to our previous lives with regret or longing, wishing we could go back to some of that old junk that we do. If, we're not, if we do that, then we're not fit for the kingdom of God. Whatever God calls you to do, do it with all your might, period. That's it. Do it with all your might, period. Number four, we need to emulate, we need to copy what Elisha did in serving the poor. Now, I don't know where God's calling you in this way. I'm going to say the poor, meaning those that don't have as much as us. Um, if you live in America, which I'm pretty sure most of you do since you came here today, if any of you came from outside of America today, thank you for traveling so far. I appreciate you coming from Canada or Mexico or wherever you came from. Thank you. Um, if you live in America, then you've got it better than like 99% of the rest of the world. Please remember that on July 4th. You got it better than 99% of the rest of the world. If you want to know, if you want proof of that, just turn on the news about five minutes and you'll see international news. Now, don't watch the news from about around here. You might decide you don't want to be in America anymore. But international news and you'll be like, oh, no, no, no. Uh, never mind. I, I, I want to stay here. We have it so good. God has blessed us so much. And so because of that, we need to have a heart for those that don't have as much as we have. I, I think about, I think about, we, we, have, we have trash cans that are, 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 are put there just for the extra food that we throw away from our tables. We have to come up with a special trash can. Are you hearing me? So that we have a place to put the food that we decided to throw away. We're the only country in the world that has a multi-billion dollar industry called, you know, storage room, storage lockers to keep our extra junk because we have so much junk at home, we don't have room for our extra junk. We got to put our extra junk, we got to take our extra junk out. We do spring cleaning every year and stuff magically appears. It's like, where did this stuff come from? Try to move the next time. Ask my friend Lisa back there who recently moved a, you know, a loved one, how stuff just appears. We have so much stuff. You're like, man, we got married and we had two suitcases and a black and white television and we move in five years and we've got so much stuff, I got to ask 46 people to help us move. <laughs> That's a result of a God who blesses us in ways you don't even realize. We give away clothes. Billion dollar industry giving away clothes. Because, you know, they're just not the right fashion anymore. I don't want straight legs. I want legs that flare. I don't want flare. I want a bell bottom. 
No, I don't. Now I want skinny jeans. I got news for you. It doesn't make you look skinny just because you wear skinny jeans. You understand what I'm saying? And we just switch because of that. And we just throwing away stuff, throwing away stuff, throwing away stuff. I mean, we have so much. It's, it, it, if you just look at it in that way, God has done so much for us, we can just reach out to those. And it's not just those that don't have as much stuff. How about those that are hurt or troubled, who are going through depression and those kind of things, and, and just caring about those people, reaching out, letting them know you're thinking about them. I, I've, I've got a person, that, uh, Gordo and I know, I, I want you to pray for this guy. His name is Charlie. He doesn't know the Lord. Okay? I, I, I'm not just saying that. Everybody got the name? Tell me the name I just said. Okay, I want you to pray for Charlie. He needs to know the Lord. That's number one. That's the most important thing we ever do. Secondary to that is that he's got a few different kinds of cancer, and I'm afraid he's going to die without the Lord. He's had a lot of troubles in his life. It's too much to tell you about right here, but he's got a lot of things that's just mixed up and changed, and you know, a lot of troubles in his life. He needs the Lord. He needs to be healed. We need to pray for him. Okay? I guarantee he makes more money than a lot of us, and yet he, he's, he's starving because he needs the Lord. He's got some of the best health care you can get your hands on. At some point, it don't matter. We're all going to die. Unless the Lord comes again, first, we're all going to die. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't give you a real hopeful message there. Sorry, you came Sunday again. What'd you learn at church today? Well, pastor said we're all going to die. Oh, great. Wonderful. Hey, as long as you know the Lord, that's okay. Amen? That's okay. Live as Christ, die as gain. Who are you helping out? Question for number four. Who are you helping out that can't pay you back? Because see, you're really good scratching somebody's back as long as they're going to what? Yeah, that's right, scratch yours. But how about, who is it that you've helped that can't help you back? When was the last time you helped somebody? Never, l listen, you say, well, I, I try to help people, and then they try to pay me back, or they say thank you. Or, then do it anonymously. So they can't know. So they can't tell you thank you. So you know you're doing it for the right reason. I mean, you know, just, just when was the last time you did something for somebody expecting nothing in return? Nothing in return. Lastly, here's something. Remember what Elisha said when Elijah said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be gone soon. The Lord's taking me home. What can I do for you? And Elisha didn't say, well, you know, I kind of like some new sandals. Uh, no, he didn't. Elisha went for the big guns, didn't he? Hey, don't be afraid. Number five to ask God for big things. You've got a big God. I was hoping to get a big amen, but it's okay. you got a big God. And so why ask a big God for little tiny things? That's like going over to a big giant bodybuilder. You ever seen these guys? they got muscles that are coming out, out of their ears, like ginormous. You know these guys? They haven't, seen, they haven't been able to straighten their arms out in like 20 years, right? And it's like going to one of these big, giant bodybuilders and saying, hey, could you pick up that piece of paper for me? Do you hear what I'm saying? I mean, isn't that kind of overkill? Why, why do I need Lou Ferrigno? That, that'll age me right there. Some of you have no idea who that is. Why do I need Lou Ferrigno to pick up a piece of paper? Hey, if I got Lou Ferrigno, you know what I'm going to ask him to do? I, if I ever meet Lou Ferrigno, I'm going to ask him to paint himself green and growl. I want to see it. Because I, I used to love the Hulk. Everybody remember that show? You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Remember that line? Come on, you know this show. Come on. Hey, if I'm going to get to see the Hulk, I'm going to ask for green, torn jeans, and growl. If, if I got God, then I'm going to ask God for big stuff. To people will tell, so what do you, where do you see Calvary in the future? I, I, we don't have time for me to tell you all the ideas and plans I have. Um, is God going to do them all? I, I don't know. I don't know, but I know this. When I die, I don't want God to say, why didn't you think bigger? I want God to chuckle at me and say, well, uh, you went a little big there, didn't you? 
that's okay. It's not going to happen. God's not going to talk to us like that. But you hear what I'm saying. Why, why not ask God? You have a big God who loves you in a big way. Why not ask him for big things? Elisha was not afraid to ask for big stuff when he talked with him, when he talked with Elijah. He had faith that God was going to answer his request. He had faith that God was about to make him the successor. He would not have asked for that double portion, which meant like, I want to be the successor. I want to be the person to follow in your shoes. I want to be like your first son, spiritually born first son. He wouldn't have asked if he didn't believe that God had already called him to that position and he knew it. He knew that's what God's will was for his life. He wouldn't have done it, but he knew. It's good to pray, listen, um, whatever your will is, God, that's what I want. That's good. Amen? That's fine. That's good. But it's also good to ask God for big stuff. Ask God for, you know, I want the whole city of Laverne to know Jesus. I want the whole city of Laverne to be saved. You say, why stop there? That's a good question. Why should I? Maybe you should ask God to save the whole city of San Dimas, and then you should ask God to save the whole city of Pomona, and you should go. That's what we should be looking for. We should be praying for everyone to be saved. We should be praying for God to, to bring people to him. We should be praying for big things from our God. He's a big God. As the musicians come forward, here's my last question. Do we think too small because we are sitting here in a small church. Do you think, as a person coming to Calvary Baptist, or a member of Calvary Baptist, do you think too small? Because you say, well, you know, we got 30, 40, 50 on a Sunday. You know, we're just a small church. There's not a lot of people that know us, whatever. Oh, really? So our God is kind of like that? Is that how you talk about your God? Yeah, I mean, he's there. He's kind of up in the air. He's somewhere there. He's in the sky. I don't know. He's kind of good. He's all right. He's, you know... Is that our God, people? That's not our God. So why do we talk like that? Why do we, why do we, why do we sell God short? Why do, we, why, do we talk like, why do we talk about God like he's that, that, that loser cousin you have that always seems to screw things up? Like That's not our God. Our God is a great, big, huge God. And maybe the reason why these seats are not full is because we're not asking God to fill them. Maybe the reason why these seats are not full is because we got people right next door to us that we should be inviting, but we're too embarrassed to invite. Hey, if you got a big God, I'm pretty sure he can handle taking care of you, inviting somebody to church. I think God can handle that. I mean, come on. What, have you thought too small? Have you decided that this is just the way it's always going to be? How about in your life? Have you decided that these issues you have, this is always going to be like that? God's never going to change. That's just who I am. That's just who mama raised. Don't blame mama. It's your fault. Change it. You got a God that can change anybody, anytime, anywhere. Anything. That's our God, people. Are, are you hearing me? That's our God. He can change you. Would you stand with me? What is he asking you to change today? What are you thinking too small? It could be here in the church. It could be at your life. It could be at home. It could be at your job. It could be your family. Where are you thinking too small? Where are you selling God short? Where are you not giving God full reins to come in and just take over? Where do you need more God in your life today as we sing?